Oh, yes. And the speakers in the last panel are Juan Del Mosso, Joseph Serrano, Dylan Fagan, and David McInerney. Uh, Juan, you are the first one. Please start if you're ready. Sorry, I speak a horrible English, so I will speak in Spanish. My intervention is very short, so you can read it. Uh, and let's talk later. Bueno, este es un libro que yo aprecio mucho por muchas razones, pero entre ellas porque es el libro a partir del cual me tuve que poner a estudiar seriamente la obra de Althusser. Por supuesto que es un libro de una gran erudición desde el punto de vista teórico y filológico, pero eso no es lo que quisiera tomar en cuenta en esta intervención, sino sobre todo su importancia política. Y desde ese punto de vista creo que Althusser and his contemporaries contiene varios aportes que son fundamentales. En primer lugar, el, uno de los aportes para rescatar me parece que es el, que, el de ofrecer una visión integral de la obra de Althusser, cuestionando esta imagen del Althusser estructuralista, enemigo de la actividad transformadora, partidario de un pensamiento del orden, una especie de ultra académico que nunca se posicionó políticamente. Esto para la gente que estudia el pensamiento de Althusser y lo conoce y está especializada puede parecer una obviedad, pero no es algo tan evidente para una audiencia más amplia. De hecho, la imagen más difundida de Althusser en, en el público en general e incluso en un público afín a ideas marxistas sigue siendo la de un marxista estructuralista, un marxista occidental que no hablaba de política, que se subordinaba al Partido Comunista, y en definitiva sigue siendo al tu ser un autor más condenado que leído. Entonces, desmitificar esta imagen creo que es uno de los grandes méritos del libro. Y re relacionado con esto, también creo que Warren desmitifica con mucha eficacia, la imagen que, que tenemos hoy de, de lo que se llamó el estructuralismo. Me parece que en este libro queda claro que lo que se dio en llamar estructuralismo es un movimiento más amplio, mucho más abierto, más complejo, menos articulado y menos cerrado de lo que se puede pensar a partir de las reconstrucciones retrospectivas de lo que fue el estructuralismo. En segundo lugar, me parece que hay que rescatar el, el trabajo que hace el libro de Warren a propósito de las ambivalencias que hay en la concepción altuseriana de la estructura y la demostración de que la cuestión de la aleatoriedad y del materialismo del encuentro ya existía desde mucho antes de la emergencia del llamado Althusser tardío o el último Althusser. Este es un tema que lo había tocado también en su libro Emilio de Hípola, pero Emilio de Hípola da una imagen de un Althusser mucho más volcado hacia el posmarxismo, ¿no? mientras que en el caso del libro de Warren, utilizando el concepto de coyuntura teórica, se puede ver la apuesta teórica de Althusser como una apuesta que se hace desde el marxismo, pero desde un marxismo que piensa su propia reelaboración en función de un campo de batalla teórico-político que es el que está planteado según el momento histórico. En tercer lugar, quería rescatar del libro de Warren que plantea una cuestión central tanto para la lectura de Althusser como para el, el análisis de los fenómenos políticos del capitalismo contemporáneo, 
que es la cuestión de la ideología como un conjunto de prácticas materiales y no solamente como ideas en la cabeza de la gente. Y la importancia de analizar no tanto su veracidad, sino su capacidad de influir y producir efectos políticos. Si pensamos que en el capitalismo actual, por ejemplo, los modelos clásicos de política hegemónica están en crisis, o más o menos en crisis, podemos también señalar que el sistema capitalista se sostiene más a base de ideología que de hegemonía. Más que una adhesión entusiasta o un consenso, hay una suerte de aceptación del capitalismo por la imposibilidad de visualizar otras alternativas, y esto en los marcos de la crisis, o de, sí, de la crisis de lo que se dio en llamar el neoliberalismo progresista, es capitalizado por las extremas derechas, que proponen una especie de ultra neoliberalismo, apelando a símbolos elementales e irracionales, pero consiguiendo cierto apoyo popular significativo. Por último, me parece que el libro plantea una hipótesis audaz sobre la cuestión de la relación entre el marxismo y el postestructuralismo. Bueno, ustedes saben que Perry Anderson propuso esta lectura del, del postestructuralismo esencialmente como un movimiento de reacción intelectual. Y en el caso del libro de Warren está pensado de otra manera. En el marco de esta idea de identificar la coyuntura teórica, Warren establece diálogos entre Althusser, Derrida, Foucault, Deleuze, que dan cuenta de que fueron contemporáneos, pero también de otras posibilidades que el simple rechazo del postestructuralismo. Eh, desde este punto de vista se podría pensar el materialismo del encuentro como una torsión filosófica que hace el ser en un contexto en el que el panorama filosófico francés se va hacia la derecha y el postestructuralismo aparece como una corriente crítica, aunque ajena al marxismo. Aquí también me parece que coinciden búsquedas anteriores de Althusser sobre la cuestión del materialismo del encuentro, que aparece, por ejemplo, en su balance del mayo del 68, o en su borrador de libros sobre el imperialismo, y la cuestión de la crisis del marxismo, que era una, en primera medida una crisis del movimiento comunista oficial, pero también una crisis de ciertos núcleos teóricos, y de esto podría estar dando cuenta el crecimiento del postestructuralismo en la izquierda y el, la, estos filósofos, los nuevos filósofos antitotalitarios en la derecha. ¿no? Ahora bien, acá yo creo que hay una, hay una dificultad para una alianza más clara entre marxismo y postestructuralismo, que es el desplazamiento que hace el postestructuralismo de la cuestión de la lucha de clases como problema teórico y político central. Y el altucer de los 70 y comienzos de los 80 es un altucer volcado bastante a la centralidad de la lucha de clases. Esto se puede ver en, bueno, obviamente en el balance mayo francés que mencionaba antes, en sus reflexiones de, sobre la reproducción, en sus críticas al abandono de la dictadura del proletariado por el Partido Comunista, en su crítica del 78 a la política y la organización interna del Partido Comunista francés, y también sus reflexiones sobre el análisis de coyuntura en 1985. Para mí, por el tipo de indagación propia que hacen los filósofos postestructuralistas, estos problemas no tienen centralidad. Entonces se podría pensar que puede haber una alianza para la crítica del idealismo y la filosofía tradicional, pero los caminos del Tusser y el postestructuralismo se separan al momento en que este último se plantea como una corriente alternativa al marxismo. Es cierto que el postestructuralismo también tiene sus ambivalencias. Fue el propio Derrida quien dijo no hay nada fuera del texto y también quien escribió espectros de Marx, dando cuenta de que Marx no podía ser dejado de lado si se quería pensar en un tiempo de crisis. Pero en líneas generales, y esto es para que responda Warren después, tengo la duda de si él no es demasiado entusiasta con el postestructuralismo en la lectura que hace en su libro. Por último, y para volver a ese análisis de coyuntura de 1985, en ese texto Althusser planteaba que hay que volver al principio materialista de la primacía de los movimientos por sobre los partidos. Esto un poco esquemáticamente se podría pensar como el correlato político del materialismo del encuentro. Una concepción de lo político en la cual los aparatos burocráticos 
autodenominados poseedores de la ciencia marxista pierden su centralidad y lo importante son los movimientos que vienen desde abajo. Me parece que no era la primera vez que Althusser hacía un planteo de este tipo, de hecho había señalado la importancia de crear comités de base en la discusión sobre la unión de la izquierda en 1978, enfatizando que el movimiento tenía que venir desde abajo. Sobre este tema hizo diversas observaciones Ernest Mandel dentro de una valoración general positiva de esa intervención de Althusser, pero señalando la necesidad de proponer más decididamente consejos obreros o soviets. Mi impresión es que esa crítica de Mandel estaba un poco fuera de contexto, pero la traigo a la discusión porque muestra la posibilidad de identificar un diálogo entre Althusser y la tradición trotskista, que es también la tradición de Warren, en torno a una cuestión fundamental como la democracia de base. Y bueno, ahí vendría mi última pregunta para la discusión en general y para saber la opinión de Warren en especial. ¿Qué es lo que él piensa que nos puede aportar hoy al Althusser para pensar las posibilidades de articular los movimientos actuales de lucha contra el capitalismo desde una perspectiva revolucionaria? Y con esto termino. Gracias. Thank you, Juan. And the ne next speaker is uh, Joseph, I think. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to thank my co-organizers, Lali and Dylan, um, for doing this, organizing this uh, with me. Um, when we started organizing this, we weren't sure exactly what the response uh, by people we asked to be part of this uh, would be. And um, it's been really nice to hear everyone's uh, stories and and, and um, hearing about everyone's personal relationships uh, to Warren's um, and hearing that. Now I understand why everyone enthusiastically uh, agreed to be part of this. So I'm very happy for that. Um, so, okay, I will uh, start my talk now. So of all the epithets, uh, qualifiers, or descriptors that we could apply to Althusser, none would seem to capture so succinctly and accurately the force of his writings as an expression that appears early in Montag's Althusser and his contemporaries. Uh, the, the line is, the disciple of Machiavelli and Lenin. Um, to accept this phrase is to appreciate the extent to which Althusser was a philosopher who thought in terms of practice and its theoretical effects of struggle and warfare, of strategy, and therefore of the precise balance of forces in a particular or rather singular conjuncture. As Montag puts this, the disciple of Machiavelli and Lenin could settle for nothing less than an exact inventory of forces in play and an identification of friends as well as enemies. In theoretical terms, this translates into a very careful and informed survey of philosophical works, reading them to the letter and noting their effects on the theoretical conjuncture of which they are a part and their effects on the relations of dominance and subordination between the ideas that constitute it. Yet if Althusser appears here to be something like a, a master strategist, uh, one who seems able or at least desires to grasp the totality or whole of a particular battlefield, someone in control of the effects of his own texts precisely because of his awareness of the effects of others, Montag cautions us against accepting this view. Uh, as he argues in the following paragraph, such an approach to Althusser's reading of structuralist works may be effective, however, only if it is carried out with the following proviso, that we not regard Althusser as a rational actor in a game of strategy, as the absolute master of his words and deeds, if not of their consequences, which can be unintended. To see Althusser as master of his works would, of course, contradict in the most flagrant way everything he himself wrote. Montag's argument here, following as it does from his description of Althusser as the disciple of Machi Machiavelli and Lenin, should give us pause. While this expression um, is stated as if these names, Machiavelli and Lenin, were stable reference, I would suggest that this phrase condenses a number of important problems and that Montag, in fact, understates the ways in which his reading or rereading of Althusser simultaneously asks us to reconsider them, Machiavelli and Lenin. Keeping this in mind, we might also consider what it means exactly to be a disciple. 
and a disciple of Machiavelli and Lenin, no less. Theological overtones aside, does the term disi disciple signify fidelity to a certain teacher, philosopher, or perhaps philosophical, if not political, tradition? Yet what becomes of this question when we are dealing not with self-enclosed and coherent systems, but writing, sentences, phrases, and words that are determinately disordered precisely in the way Althusser suggests? Framing, for example, his own discussion of Machiavelli and Machiavelli and us, Althusser warns, warns us that, quote, a philosophical reader who wishes to enroll Machiavelli in his own ranks will rapidly have come to realize that Machiavelli marches in the opposite direction from that in what from that in which one wishes to make him march, or even worse, that if he certainly does not fire in the line of march, we do not even know where he is firing, he always fires elsewhere, end quote. So what would it mean to be a disciple of such a figure? What is the nature of the discipleship um, at stake here? To begin to develop this question, I want to look at two passages from Althusser in which the names Machiavelli and Lenin appear in similar but not identical terms. So first, I'm going to look at a, a I'm going to look at the use Althusser makes of Lenin in his lectures published as um, Philosophy and the Spontaneous Philosophy of the Scientists. Uh, then I'm going to look at um, a few paragraphs from Machi Machiavelli and us. Uh, the problem here, I think, hinges on uh, Althusser's notion of the conjuncture, which Robin has illuminated for us uh, earlier today, but more importantly on the prepositions that Althusser uses to theorize Lenin's and Machiavelli's relationships to their conjunctures. Okay, so Althusser's discussion of Lenin's political practice in um, the lectures Philosophy and the Spontaneous Philosophy of the Scientists is meant to specify what distinguishes uh, philosophical practice from other types of practice, or what he will call uh, pragmatism, subjectivism, volunteerism. Uh, while keeping the, the thrust of his argument in mind, I also want to pay attention to some of the phrases he includes, phrases which might appear to borrow one of Montag's suggestion, suggestions, quote, to push well beyond the requirements of the argument. Considering these phrases compels us to ask whether they might not possess a symptomatic significance in the passage, that is, whether they refer to questions Althusser does not pose yet compels us by his silence to pose for him. To begin, let us note that for Althusser, philosophy, insofar as it is political and its practice may be represented by Lenin's political practice, mm -hmm. differs, differs from that of a mechanic or surgeon, whereas the latter two uh, act according to an idea in their head. Uh, Lenin is inside of, is part of the conjuncture in which he, you know, adjusts and intervenes. Um, let's follow Althusser's own Leninist practice of drawing lines of demarcation and register the line he draws through the notions of acting and, and, and action. In the first case, that of the mechanic or surgeon, but also a certain understanding of political action. Althusser identifies what he calls a pragmatist conception of practice and action. Quote, according to which all these adjusters adjust their part, their political line, their intervention to obtain a result, attain an end that governs their action from the exterior. According to this representation, action is the action of a subject uh, who adjusts or tinkers with his intervention with an end in view. That is for the achievement of an aim that exists in his head to be realized in the external world. If we accept that argument, we deserve to be called pragmatists, subjectivists, volunteerists, end quote. Um, it's worth considering Althusser's use of the term subject here, which uh, is clearly connected to his use elsewhere, but differs from it in certain ways. Uh, here, the subject is the one who acts with an end in view, who acts to achieve an end, and we might add an end for which they and they alone are responsible. Um, but for Althusser, this type of action um, this action of a subject can in no way be used to describe that of the, pol quote, political leader, Lenin, precisely because um, of the difference in terms of Lenin's relationship to his object. So I want to, I'm going to read uh, the main passage I want to discuss now. It's, it's a, kind of long. So this is Althusser. The mechanic who adjusts his part knows very well that the motor pre-exists him and waits for it waits for his work to be completed, to begin to run the engine again. It is completely external to him. So with the surgeon, it is certainly more complicated, but he is not part of the patient. In contrast, 
The political leader Lenin interests us for different reasons, and it is not by chance that we have borrowed his terms, drawing a line of demarcation, thesis, think of the April theses, and correct. Uh, these are political terms, but they suit our purposes, and it, is cert and it certainly suits our purposes that the practice which helps us to think the proper practice of philosophy as adequately as possible should be political. So for in contrast to the mechanic and the surgeon who are subjects who act on the basis of an idea in their mind, one, because they are subjects, and two, because this idea simply reflects the fact that the engine to be repaired or the patient to be operated on are external, exists outside their minds. Lenin, the politician, the working class leader, is well and truly internal to the conjuncture in which he must act if he is going to be able to act on it. He. Lenin is not a subject who has in mind an idea that he will carry out and wants to realize externally. He is the leader of a class struggle organization, the vanguard of the popular masses, and insofar as he defines a correct line, one step ahead of the masses and one step only, he is simply reflecting in order to inflect a balance of forces in which he participates and, and takes sides. Okay, that's the end of the, the passage. So for those who are familiar with Althusser's work, even those who have maybe only a general understanding of his work, most of the terms and concept, concepts Althusser deploys here are not unusual. What is perhaps less uh, commented on is Althusser's insistence that Lenin, unlike the mechanic or surgeon, uh, is, not a, is not a subject. Although we all know that Althusser is one of the most uh, perhaps infamous critics of the concept of the subject, I think there's still something uh, worth exploring in Althusser's um, argument here. Um, further, uh, it's one thing to say that the, the masses are not a subject, the proletariat is not a subject, much less the subject of history. Um, though as Balibar once argued, the masses may act as a subject in history, but note that um, as and in are not the same thing as are and of. But um, it might be a different thing to refer to a, to a historical individual and one who certainly seems to have played a decisive role in history as a non-subject. In fact, what follows in, in Althusser's sentence, I think, makes things maybe even less clear. Lenin is not a, a subject who acts in a way that realizes an idea in his head, but he is nevertheless, quote, the leader of a class struggle organization, the vanguard of, pop of the popular masses, and insofar as he defines a correct line, one step ahead of the masses and one step only, he is simply reflecting in order to inflect a balance of forces in which he participates and takes sides. What does it mean to say that Lenin, by acting inside the conjuncture, simply reflects, reflects it in order to inflect, inflect it? What type of reflection is at stake here? Um, according to Althusser, Lenin is, quote, well and true, truly internal to the conjuncture, and he must be able to act in it if he is going to be able to act on it. The At this point, the, the play between the prepositions in and on suggests a few things about the concept of the conjuncture that Althusser is uh, developing here. And it is only by thinking and acting within the conjuncture that one may simultaneously, perhaps, there might be some delay, it's not exactly clear to me, um, but by acting within the conjuncture, one may simultaneously produce and find themselves within the space, the opening, the empty place, maybe the void that allows one to act on it, to effect a shift within it, within its balance of forces, perhaps to change or transform it. Um, of course, the effects are not always what one intends and what may seem like a productive theoretical or pol political development at one point may in turn become an obstacle at a later date. And uh, I suppose we could say that if if Lenin or any political leader who happens to be one step ahead of, the, ahead of the masses is not a subject, it is because they do not occupy the central place in the conjunctures balance of forces, but merely one of its nodes, an argument which complicates the idea that Lenin or the party, the Communist Party is one step ahead of the masses at all. I will come back to this point um, about being one step ahead of the masses, Lenin's relationship to the masses at the end of my talk. Uh, but for now, I, I want to I want to turn to similar passages in which, as you said, describes Machiavelli. 
Althusser's language, as we will see, is similar, but not identical. According to Althusser, Machiavelli, whose problem is uh, to think the deed to be accomplished, the unification of the Italian nation, does not pose the problem of national, national unity in general, but, quote, in terms of the case, and hence the singular conjuncture. So by demarcating the singular conjuncture, which is in fact one of sev several, uh, th that, that phrase singular conjuncture uh, is one of several late handwritten additions to the text from general as well as particular theoretical problems, Althusser suggests that the former is concerned with something other than general type of knowledge. It is neither general nor, no, nor particular, but concrete. Uh, and it is for this reason that Althusser ventures to declare that Machiavelli is the first theorist of the conjuncture, or the first thinker consciously, an interesting term for at least start to use here, if not to think the concept of conjuncture, if not to make it the object of an abstract and systematic reflection, then at least uh, consistently, in an insistent, extremely profound way, to think in the conjuncture, that is to say, in its concept of an aleatory singular case. Um, and I believe aleatory singular case is also a, 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 another late um, addition. So in an important sense, Althusser refers here to the primacy of practice, to the necessity to enact something before it is possible to theorize it. Yet it is almost as if he suggests that to think in the conjuncture is merely a first step toward thinking the concept of the conjuncture, to think and produce the concept of the conjuncture via an abstract and systematic reflection. Does this line of argumentation suggest that Althusser maintains um, or discovers this need for a general theory of the conjuncture, one that could account for all of the aleatory singular cases of its various uh, regions? Uh, what In what follows, uh, however, it is clear that this is not the case. For it is at this point in Machiavellian Us that Althusser defines what it means to think in the conjuncture. On the one hand, he writes, to think in the conjuncture, quote, means taking account of all the determinations, all the existing concrete circumstances, making an inventory, a detailed comparison of them, end quote. It is significant that Althusser does not use the term totality, at least not in this passage, even though his definition seems to lead in this direction. Indeed, what are we to make uh, of this need to take into account all the determinations and co concrete circumstances? Uh, and as Althusser writes of Lenin in um, the other text we were just looking at, quote, Lenin too had to take into account all uh, two, the elements of a conjuncture before fixing the cor correct political line. So this, uh, to me, seems quite at odds with the um, point made earlier about in a conflictual conflictual situation, it's impossible to see everything um, at once. Uh, and then, so on the other hand, and keeping in mind Althusser's criticisms of the concept of totality, we might take this to mean that the task of thinking in the conjuncture involves grasping a non-totalizable and perhaps infinite sum, certainly an impossible, if not unthinkable task. But another question, who is this figure or who is able to take all this into account? Would this figure not be someone who is located or, or one who must look, place themselves at the center of the conjuncture? Would this figure not be a subject, above all the subject armed with their two? And it is here that Althusser once again, it, or it is here that once again, Althusser's prepositions uh, become significant. As Althusser writes, to think in the conjuncture, it is not sufficient to take into account all, all of the elements and circumstances. More importantly, and here Althusser introduces a preposition we have not yet seen, to think under, sue the category of the conjuncture, is not to think on the conjuncture as one would reflect on a set of concrete data. The, invent the inventory of concrete circumstances, determinations, and all other forces at play are not simply uh, data that a subject reflects on, and let us notice that this term to reflect uh, was the term Althusser used to describe, um, to uh, affirmatively describe um, Lenin's practice. Um, rather, quote, to think under the conjuncture is quite literally to submit, se soumettre, 
to the problem that produces and imposes its case. I want to point out here that the grammatical subject of Eldusar's sentences sentence here is not a person, um, but this activity, thinking. And while the name uh, Machiavelli reappears in the following sentences, um, it, sig it's, it signifies not necessarily the one who acts, but the one who is uh, almost acted on or, or um, called to act. Uh, um, so in any case, Althusser has substituted thinking under for thinking uh, in, and the result is that the one who thinks, the one tasked with thinking must submit themselves or perhaps be submitted or perhaps subjected to the problem that is produced and imposed in the conjuncture by the conjuncture and above all produced in and imposed on the one who thinks or is tasked with thinking. So what does it mean to submit oneself to the conjuncture? Althusser does not necessarily answer this, but it is worth pointing out that the term submit, as we all know, plays an important role in the ISA's essay, above all in the ambiguity Althusser highlights in the definition of the term subject. Quote, a center of initiatives, the author and therefore the one responsible for their actions on the one hand and on the other. Quote, a subjected being who submits to a higher authority and therefore one who is stripped of all freedom except that of freely accepting their submission. In fact, in what follows in the lectures on Machiavelli, there is an interesting resonance with some of these themes from the ISA's essay. As you say, writes, quote, here the terms must be inverted. Machiavelli does not think the problem of national unity in terms of the conjuncture. It is the conjuncture itself that negatively, yet objectively, poses the problem of Italian national unity. Of course, the conjuncture is not a subject, but is, it is nevertheless that to which Machiavelli must submit, that by which Machiavelli is subjected. Um, we might say that um, the conjuncture, the, the case, uh, the aleatory here is, is Fortuna that makes Machiavelli, the prophet, uh, submit. Um, so it, it is the philosopher that is subjected here. And this transformed the activity of, of thinking into something else. Althusser writes, Quote, Machiavelli merely registers in his theoretical position a problem that is objectively historically posed by the case of the conjuncture, not by simple intellectual comparisons, but by the confrontation of existing class forces and their rela relationship of uneven development, in fact, by their aleatory future. So thinking becomes registering. But to register, register here does not mean simply to record or to, to reproduce, or even as is, is, is the case with Lenin, to reflect. On the contrary, what is registered by the one who submits to the conjuncture is the uneven development of class, for, uh, of class forces locked in struggle. To think in and under, to submit to or be subjected by the conjuncture and the problem posed by it, uh, if it is in some sense to become a vessel of, of the conjuncture, it's certainly not to become a mere expression of it. If for no other reason than that to register the problem uh, posed by the conjuncture, is to register the empty place that emerges in the course of class struggle that is, as Althusser puts it, its aleatory future, the place in which it is possible and necessary to act and intervene. We might say then that to think under the conjuncture um, displaces or uh, um, dislocates the contradiction between act, uh, activity and passivity. And this is one problem I'd like to keep uh, discussing. Um, okay, so I want to uh, abruptly turn back to, um, to the uh, philosophy and spontaneous uh, philosophy of the scientists and, and that um, line or slogan that Althusser seems to uh, use um, in a number of different places, uh, almost as if it were a, a tick of some sort. Um, and he places it within quotation marks, the line about um, Lenin being one step ahead of the masses and one step only, um, which I'm su suggesting is sort of exceeding the bounds of uh, the requirements of his argument. So if we read this in light of Althusser's lectures on Machiavelli, we might say that um, uh, you know, if Lenin or the party is one step ahead, one step only of the masses, it is not because he or it leads the masses, but on the contrary, because Lenin submits to the masses, 
to the mass movements, registering the moods of the masses, their internal conflicts, and their aleatory futures. But it is finally the masses who produce and impose the problems that are registered by Lenin in theory. And uh, the masses appear in a number of places in Althusser and his contemporaries. And I want to conclude with quoting one of uh, for me, what is one of the most striking instances. In the final paragraph of the chapter uh, on Althusser's ISA's essay and Foucault's Discipline and Punish, um, this is chapter eight, I believe, Montag writes, quote, a shift in the relationship of forces had disrupted the regime of painstakingly disconnected individualities, each encased in the cage of its own subjectivity. Uh, and allowed them to break free and coagulate into mass movements that in turn disrupted and in disrupting made visible the rituals of subjection in factories, schools, and prisons. As the balance of power shifted, so did the relations of knowledge. Each incursion of mass struggle, like a flare over the battlefield, revealed the obstacles, traps, and emplacements that blocked the way forward. Um, we could spend a lo lot of time, I think, discussing this, this passage. Um, but I think it helps us understand what is at stake in, in Althusser's argument that Lenin is not a subject. And I want to suggest that Althusser's Lenin, the political leader, submits to the masses. Um, and this is why he is able to, quote, break out of the cage of his own subjectivity, not only in words, but also in deeds, and to shift the balance of forces and with the masses uh, enact a, a ruptural unity or revolution. And I would conclude by saying that if there is an Althusser we might call Montag's Althusser, it is, it is an Althusser who submits to and registers the actions of the masses, an Althusser who thinks in and learns from the masses. And it is this Althusser that deserves to be called the disciple of Machiavelli and Lenin. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. That was great. And the next speaker is Dylan. Hello. Can we uh, hear me? Yes, I hear you. Great. Um, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to commemorate Althusser and his contemporaries in this symposium. A symposium being a chance for reprise and therefore a prize with an S. I don't think I need to mention to many here that Pries in French, and here I quote the New Cassel's French dictionary, is, quote, taking, capture, prize with a Z, hold, handle, purchase, grasp, grip, quarrel, dose, pinch of snuff, for instance, fighting, close quarters, close quote, and repri is, resu quote, resumption, taking back, retaking, recapture, recovery, reconquest, revival, renewal, return of an illness, for instance, repair, darn, repetition, mark of repetition, burden, refrain of a song, pickup, acceleration of an engine, close quote. This symposium, therefore, is an opportunity to practice these activities by reading Althusser and his contemporaries. Already having said here, Althusser and his contemporaries, let us hasten to add, hearing for ourselves a kind of humorous hailing, do not forget the subtitle. Philosophy's Perpetual War, like that other important subtitle, Critique of Political Economy, ought to be regarded throughout here. Reading and rereading Althusser and his contemporaries for this symposium brought forth three particular points, nodes, or realms of Marxist the theory that I want to briefly discuss today. They are domination, commanding, and cooperation, which I feel exist in various and important ways in the book. To use a phrase from Althusser, we want to identify how the book generates philosophical countercurrents, specifically regarding the problematic of domination, and how this in turn bears on our understanding of commanding and cooperation as positions or instances. To back up for one moment again before proceeding, we do want to first say that our entire consideration here primarily concerns Althusser's notion of a practice, and specifically practices of reading and writing. For reading and writing, 
is a particular instance of activity that intervenes on ideological effectivity as such and reading and writing therefore in the most clear and yet diabolical way is how one prizes and reprises practices of reading and writing thus are how one can attempt to introduce a kind of divagation into, for instance, philosophy's perpetual war. Althusser and his contemporaries is both the demonstration of this problematic, as well as an effort in the true sense to introduce emending effects into that very field of reading and writing that is the ideological, that is to say, the political. So to begin, I want to remark upon what I feel are some extraordinarily important effects that emerge through a kind of critique of domination in this book. In many places and in many ways, Althusser and his contemporaries demonstrates how the notion of domination is susceptible, particularly in the history or chronicle of reading Althusser and particularly particular texts such as the reading of the ISA essay early in this chronicle, to a kind of ideological effectivity which bears significant and specifically political effects. This is the notion that ideology simply dominates human beings who are its passive patients, that ideology is simply error by individuals, simply misrecognition by individuals. We will not rehearse all of the twists and turns taken here, but they are important ones. Many of them have been spoken about today, specifically regarding chapter eight. Uh, Natalia, Yorgos, Stefano, many others have talked about this. We focus here on chapter three, settling accounts with phenomenology, Husserl and his critics, particularly the exposition of the critique by Althusser, Jean Cavallez, and Georges Canguilhem on the question of this is Althusser, quote, the entire complex reality of history, close quote, and quote, the intelligence of scientific history itself, close quote, according to phenomenology. In contrast to its notion of a history of science based on the progress of problem solving, Warren writes on page 44, quote, on the contrary, as Althusser jocularly puts it, quote, reality has a bit more imagination, double close quotation. My remarks today are oriented specifically towards the sentence, which I think bears both a crucial critique of domination and moreover identifies the effectivity of humor and humors on the critique of political economy. In order to do this, I want to reread a passage from Capital in part eight that I think articulates how the concept of commanding comes to displace a spurious or ideological notion of domination. In the English language Ben Folk's translation, this is upstream in chapter 30, entitled Impact of the Agricultural Revolution on Industry, the Creation of a Home Market for Industrial Capital. In the German, it's section five of chapter 24, De Sohanata or Sprunglich Accumulation. That's page 773 of the Marx Engels Verka, Bond 23. And in English, it's page 909. To first remember here again, in part eight of Capital, Marx articulates so called primitive accumulation in the sequence of concepts. This begins with the secret of primitive accumulation. It continues to the expropriation of the agricultural people from the land, the bloody legislation against the expropriated since the end of the 15th century, the forcing down of wages by act of parliament, the genesis of the industrial capitalist, the impact of agricultural revolution on industry, the historical tendency of capitalist accumulation, and then finally to the modern theory of colonization. One of the significant attributes of this sequence is the way that the capitalist forms themselves are shown to be bearers of a process which does not necessarily appear in the capitalist forms themselves. This is therefore a particular loss of necessity, a particular losing that serves to displace the ideological problematics that are the categories of classical political economy. 
We also note that here, as elsewhere in capital, there is a particular discursive jocularity. Jokes abound. One example, when Marx reports of the immense death from famine in the Bayuwangi region of East Java under Dutch colonial administration from 1750 to 1811, Marx quips, that is the du commerce. Faux gives, that is peaceful commerce. Du commerce is untranslatable. Marx changes the very house of language within the sentence itself. And finally here, we can recall that Freud said in his study, jokes and their relation to the unconscious, that certain words are left out in telling jokes. Jokes have to take out certain words in order to say something. We will return to this at the end here. In chapter 30 of Capital, the impact of agricultural revolution on industry, Marx elucidates why the domination meet by the forms of capital and commodity are not adequate to the domination of the capitalist conjuncture itself. For the population in the capitalist process is now, Marx writes, transformed into material elements of variable capital. That's the bottom of 908. In this situation, Marx writes, and this is 909, the flax looks exactly as it did before. Not a fiber of it is changed, but a new social soul has entered into its body. It now forms a part of the constant capital of the master manufacturer. Formerly, it was divided among a mass of small producers who cultivated it themselves and span it with their families in small portions. Now it is concentrated in the hands of one capitalist who sets others to spin and weave it for him. The extra labor expended in flax spinning was realized formerly in extra income to numerous peasant families, or perhaps in the time of Frederick II in taxes pour the roi de Prusse. Now it is realized in profit for a few capitalists. The spindles and looms formerly scattered over the face of the countryside are now crowded together in a few great labor barracks together with the workers and the raw material. And spindles, looms, and raw material are now transformed from means for the independent existence of the spinners and weavers into the means for commanding them and extracting unpaid labor from them. You cannot tell from looking at the large factories and the large farms that they have originated from the combination of many small centers of production and have been built up by the expropriation of many small independent producers. Nevertheless, unprejudiced observers did not allow themselves to be deceived, close quote. The means of production are, Marx writes here, transformed from means for the independent existence of spinners and weavers into the means for commanding them and extracting unpaid labor from them. The problematic of the domination of the individual is decidedly displaced here. For a schema of individual domination by the capitalist forms forecloses the processual posteriority that is the commanding and moreover extracting of unpaid labor by transformed spindles, looms, and raw material. The consequences of this transformed problematic are made explicit by the next sentence where Marx writes, you cannot tell, close quote. There is thus a losing here of the synthesis of an individual consciousness. To return to where we began in chapter three of Althusser and his contemporaries, we can say that the problematic of a passive dominated phenomenological individual obfuscates the interpolation of you cannot tell from looking at the large that they have been built up by the expropriation of many small. Warren's book demonstrates in many ways why the problematic of individuals who are dominated by ideology blocks out the processually developed problematic that is the reproduction of the means for commanding and extracting of unpaid labor. Marx, Freud, and Althusser all write jocularly in their efforts to displace particular ideological theoretical practices. 
We have seen that the problematic of passively dominated subjects or egos by ideology is not adequate to the capitalist mode of production and its concomitant modes of cooperation. For even the partisan mouthpieces of capital and classical political economy note that the capitalist does not absolutely dominate the wage worker or the capital form. And yet cooperation is not simply an addition of extant capitalist parts dominated or otherwise. We here instead note that there are certain modes or kinds of cooperation that lose particular notions of domination and command, such as those practiced by Husserlian phenomenology. This loss is crucial to the aforementioned presentation by Althusser in his prefatory remark to Pierre Machere's piece entitled Georges Canguilhem's Philosophy of Science, Epistemology and History of Science from 1964. What is cooperation for the critique of political economy? Can I say jocularly chapter 13 in capital? Is it reading and writing in Althusser's sense of a practice, the aforementioned prize and reprise? My apologies for these efforts of minimal wit, but I do think that Althusser and his contemporaries does articulate a particular humorous practice of co cooperation in Althusser's thinking that is pertinent to our considerations. The, the entry for opera in Chambers Murray Latin English Dictionary gives, quote, pains, exertion, labor, service, close quote. For co, it gives cum, that which is mutual or common. Cooperation is thus the pains, exertion, or conatus in common. The notion of humor is also germane here. Humor is both the notion of a physical disposition and a mental quality, as well as the bringing about of those dispositions. Humor is a minded body. As this humor, we can say that cooperation does not foreclose a bar between minds and bodies. Cooperation is instead, we want to suggest, the humorous materiality of ideology. In chapter three, Settling Accounts with Phenomenology, Warren elucidates how Althusser and his contemporaries marshaled critical energy to point out the practical effects of Husserl and the big name phenomenology. At its core, Warren writes, quote, such a logic of scientific discovery is nothing more than an ideal of how a science ought to advance, but may not, open parentheses, every such norm has its exceptions, close parentheses, close quote. Warren then writes, quote, on the contrary, as Althusser jocularly puts it, reality has a bit more imagination, double close quotation. Althusser's phrase in French is la réalité a un peu plus d'imagination. The reported speech quotation in the sentence is from the aforementioned introduction to Pierre Machere's Georges Canguilhem's Philosophy of Science, Epistemology and History of Science, published in 1964. Althusser's longer passage, which comes towards the end of the piece, is as follows. And this is uh, Ted Stoltz's translation. I saw Ted was here earlier. Reality has a little more imagination. There are imaginary responses which leave the real problem they evade without a true response. There are sciences which are called sciences and are only the scientific imposture of a social ideology. There are non-scientific ideologies which, in paradoxical encounters, give birth to true discoveries, just as one sees fire leap from the impact of foreign bodies. The entire complex reality of history, in all its determinations, economic, social, ideological, thereby enters into play in the intelligence of scientific history itself. Bachelard's, Canguilhem's, and Foucault's oeuvre offers proof of it, close quote. Many things we could say here regarding domination, commanding, and cooperation. At the very least, we want to say that Althusser outlines how so-called epistemology and epistemologies bear political practices themselves, and that cooperation for phenomenology with its so-called individuals 
might not always lose the capitalist forms of domination and commanding. We could also note that this cooperation held in reading Bachelard, Kengilem, and Foucault begins here humorously with the statement, reality has a bit more imagination. The humorous form of cooperation is produced, Freud said, by a mode of work that is a taking away, that is to say, by a work of losing certain words. Quoting Theodore Lips, Freud writes, quote, the joke says what it has to say, not always in few words, but in too few words. That is, in words that are insufficient by a strict logic or by common modes of thought and speech. It may even actually say what it has to say by not saying it, close quote. Cooperation thus is not simply the activity of a summation, a convergence, or a synthesis of individuals. Cooperation is also the activity that loses, that separates, that takes away at once a relation at what, and what Marx calls a gefühl, which Newcastle German Dictionary gives as feeling, sentiment, emotion, touch, sense, sensation. This cooperation is thus a minded body suspended over an abyss. With certain humors, the mind and the body can cooperate to lose particular forms, relations, and emotions, such as the dominations and commandings spoken by the capitalist character masks, including its so-called scientists. To do this is to bring about the emendation of the intellect in ideological state apparatuses. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. That was great. And the last speaker in this panel is David. David, please start when you're ready to. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Yes, of course. Great. Uh, good morning from Australia. I um, missed some of the earlier speakers because I was asleep. Um, I will. I appreciate the fact this is going to be recorded on and uh, replayed on YouTube, so I can catch up. Um, I just want to say thank you to the everyone who's organised this, everyone who's participated, and especially to Warren, who has, um, you know, been my friend since the nineties, and uh, has really been inspiration for my own thinking like since then since i uh i don't have any fancy bookshelf behind me but i have this and all of his other books here and this is the unthinkable swift and uh i wrote to warren after that came out and uh, expressed my enthusiasm for it so i've been talking to him since then he's helped me a lot over the years and he's kind of like the uh my older brother or cool uncle rather than a father figure. Um, but uh, yeah, I have um, learned a lot from studying his books over the years. So today I just want to talk about um, the concept of a contemporary features in a couple of his books. Okay, so for my talk today, I want to consider a contemporary as it appears in the subtitles of two of Warren's best known books, Althusserian's Contemporaries, Philosophy's Perpetual War, which we're talking about today, and Bodies, Masses, Power, Spinoza and His Contemporaries from 1999. What does it mean exactly to think about contemporaries in a materialist way? Here I want to draw a con contrast between these two books that will draw our attention to this notion by their very subtitles. Hence, and by simply drawing attention to the different kinds of contemporaries discussed in these two books. Okay, so in Althusser and his contemporaries, we find that the main ones discussed are those who Warren describes elsewhere as Althusser's philosophical allies, Lacan, Foucault, Deleuze, and Derrida. If Althusser was engaged in a perpetual war, we might say that these four contemporaries were on his side. On the other hand, if we consider bodies, masses, power, we find that 
The main contemporaries of Spinoza that are discussed are Descartes, Hobbes, and Locke. There is no clear sense in which they might be considered Spinoza's allies. The old introduction also contains an extended discussion of the American sociologist George C. Homans, who might be seen as playing the Hobbes to Althusser Spinoza in the 1960s, and as an American sociologist was probably never read by Althusser, and in 1964, Homans, as a bourgeois sociologist, was uh, unlikely to have read Althusser either. Um, like Hobbes, Homans, while a contemporary, can be seen as a, an objectively constituted adversary. Okay, so there's very different um, sense of contemporaries in these two books. In this book, when a contemporary is mentioned, they're generally not a friend, but a foe. Okay, so with this difference in mind, I want to return to the division between us and them that is, was evoked in the titles of both Althusser's Machiavelli and Us and a now old and obscure special issue of Borderlands e-journal that I edited in 2004, Althusser and Us. In doing so, I want to bring in the concepts of literary reproduction and trans individuality to open up the question of not only the conjunctural character of any intervention, but also that of how dead philosophers are reanimated by the living, becoming present as allies or antagonists within texts compelled to return to their works, and how these relations are mediated not only by the materiality of reading, but also by the very words on their pages and their theses must be pushed this way or that to acquire a semblance of coherence. In considering this question of what a, is a contemporary, we need to first consider what it means to speak of contempor contemporaneity. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, this question is fundamental to Althusser's work and is discussed explicitly and at length in his contribution to Reading Capital, which draws lines of demarcation between transitive, expressive, and imminent concepts of causality, expressive totalities and structured wholes, and simple and complex contradictions. Although this differential temporality is most amply discussed in Reading Capital, as Warren has claimed in Althusser and his contemporaries and elsewhere, there is a strong continuity between Althusser's works from at least the little book Montesquieu, Politics and History, to Machiavelli and Us. And while some theses were decisively rejected in the course of Althusser's self-criticism after 1966, this account of time and the concept of the conjuncture are both retained and developed further. Thus, I'll not make too much of the differences between this discussion of temporality and reading capital and the self-criticism that followed it, except regarding how the temporality of philosophy in particular was transformed by Althusser's second definition of philosophy. Um, returning to Althusser's, to chapter four of Althusser's contribution to, of, to reading capital, we find the following. I now come to the concept of historical time. As this concept can only be based on the, this is a quote, um, based on the complex and differentially articulated structure and dominance of the social totality that constitutes the social formation arising from a determinate mode of production, it is only possible to give a content to the concept of historical time by defining historical time as the specific form of the existence of the social totality under consideration, an existence in which different structural levels of temporality interfere because of the particular relations of correspondence, non-correspondence, articulation, dislocation, and torsion which obtain between the different levels of the whole in accordance with the general structure, end of quote. This passage comes after a long critical account of historicism, which Althusser argues understands history as a, succession, as a succession of periods or ages reducible to the spirit of which they are the expression together with an empiricist concept of history that reduces time to calendrical time. In contrast to such ideological concepts of historical time as a sequence of essential sections, Althusser argues that we must construct the concepts of different historical times out of the differential nature and differential articulation 
of their objects in the structure of the whole. In other words, the temporality of each theoretical object must be constructed in theory in relation to other, other objects and grasped in terms of relations within the structured whole that is necessarily uneven and con contradictory. Here we can see that for Althusser, any notion of the of contemporary or contemporaneity cannot simply refer to common sense notions of calendrical time, but rather must be constructed in theory. And I'm sort of struggling a little bit here because I think I'm working from an earlier version of my uh, paper, but we'll, we'll persist. Well, this iPad's betrayed me this morning. In recording, in reading Capital, Althusser constructs an account of something called Marxist theory, consisting of a science, historical materialism, and a philosophy, dialectical materialism, with the latter defined as the theory of theoretical practice, a bourgeois ju juridical conception of philosophy as the science of sciences. While Althusser claimed here that both the sciences and philosophy were transformed by Marx's epistemological break, his subsequent self-criticism overturned this thesis, drawing a line of demarcation between philosophy and the sciences with regard to their development. From the uh, philosophy course for scientists onwards, this is 1967, um, Althusser argued that philosophy does not have a history in the sense that there is a history of the sciences and that while philosophy emerges, as, emerges with the first science, there is no structural transformation of philosophy thereafter. Althusser argues hereafter that philosophy has no object in the sense that science has an object and that philosophy has no history in the sense in which science has a history. That's from Elements of Self-Criticism. Um, maybe from Reply to John Lewis, I think. Um, specific philosophies emerge with specific combinations of theoretical concepts and ideological notions, generally dominated at least before the appearance of historical materialism by the idealist tendency that, but there is no history of philosophy in the structural sense. It is not structurally transformed by each new philosophy in an irreversible manner, but rather remains un, rather remains um, marked by revolutions and counter-revolutions, advances and reversals in much the same manner as there is a history of ideologies, but no history of ideology in general. In Elements of Self-Criticism, Althusser provides a discussion of the process by which a science emerges from its ideological prehistory in two distinct senses. In the first ordinary sense, the birth of the science does not um, differ from that of a philosophy or an ideology or indeed of any other thing. His account here is much like that given in Machiavelli and Us regarding the formation of a nation state in that a, the new science erupts suddenly out of the, and here's a quote, out of the unpredictable, incredibly complex and paradoxical, but in its contingency necessary conjunction of ideological, political, scientific, philosophical, and other elements, which at some moment discover, but after the event, that they needed each other. Since they came together without ever recognizing each other in the theoretical shape of a newborn science. Here, Althusser alludes to, but does not explicitly discuss, the question of reproduction, or of of how the science of a of mergers of a science depends not only on this combination of elements, but also on the development of material apparatuses and practices in which this new science can take hold and be reproduced, and in the process displace its precursors in a material sense. In this second sense, Althusser specifies that Althusser specifies. Um, delineates the relations of a new science to these theoretical ideologies that preceded and to other already existing sciences. Compared to other sciences, it has its own distinct object. With regard to its prehistory, the new science can never go back, but instead slams the door on its historical precursors. And here I have another quote um, from Elements of Self-Criticism. 
A new science rejects all or part of its prehistory, calling it erroneous, an error. It hardly matters that its judgment is, strictly speaking, unjust. It is just not too bothered with the detail. And it hardly matters, on the contrary, that ideolo ideologists arrive on the scene much later, when it is clear that this fatherless infant can no longer be gotten rid of and provided with an official genealogy which, in order to conjure the child away, looks into its prehistory, chooses for it and imposes on it the father that had to have this child to keep it a bit quiet. It hardly matters, or on the contrary, it matters very much that genuine scholars, rather heretically of course, come on the scene very much later to re-establish the existence of lines of descent so complex and so contingent in their necessity that they force the conclusion that the child was born without a single identifiable father. But one must nevertheless accept the evidence and try to take account of this fact. Every recognized science not only has emerged from its own prehistory, but continues endlessly to do so by rejecting what it considers to be error. And here we might see a bit of an um, allusion to uh, Foucault's genealogy as well here in terms of method. Uh, while Althusser states that a science never comes to an end, but every science begins, a new science must take hold before we can speak of it as existing in any meaningful sense. Until the new science takes hold and transforms the theoretical field to ensure its progress, it might, as this passage suggests, simply be gotten rid of like a defenseless orphan. It is this irreversibility once it has taken hold, when it has taken hold like a new mode of production, that distinguishes the, the history of the sciences from the history of philosophies, in that philosophy, like ideology, has no history, but rather history only takes place within its eternal, unchanging structure, appearing within philosophy from outside. In philosophy, on the other hand, nothing ever really becomes obsolete, but rather is repurposed, refashioned, and reanimated. If philosophy has no history, in that it is never transformed structurally, but instead always retains the structure of a perpetual war between idealism and materialism, then no concept, thesis, or even metaphor found in philosophy is finally dead and abandoned. And we can thus return again to Plato, Aristotle, Lucretius, Hobbes, Locke, Spinoza, Kant, Hegel, and all the others, together with other more obscure and forgotten philosophers, which we can then resurrect as required. Unlike the works of the alchemist that Victor Frankenstein chanced upon in the bookshelves of an inn near the baths of Thanon, which his father dismissed as trash and his professors at the University of Ingolstadt um, told him to forget about, the theory of, or the theory of phlogiston discussed with, by Engels or the theories of the phrenologists and their skulls. Nothing in philosophy ever really dies. Instead, through a process of reanimation, to evoke uh, Frankenstein again, we might grasp less figuratively via, which we might grasp less figuratively via Mascheret's concept of literary reproduction, old concepts and theses are given new relevance in their own conjuncture. Indeed, each new philosophy proceeds in this manner utilizing old theses and concepts and repurposing them in grasping new knowledges produced within the sciences. Okay, now I want to consider philosophy and us. Now I would like to expand my discussion beyond Althusserian and his bodies and his contemporaries and my body's masses power in, to consider the conduct of this perpetual war of philosophy with allies against with allies and against adversaries, using not not um, only Althusser's philosophy, but also Mascheret's literary theory and Balabar's theory of subjection, with a view to grasping the relations between philosophical intervention, literary reproduction, and trans individuality. Uh, let me start by noting a series of interventions by Warren Montag around the turn of the century by which I mean like uh, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, um, that rejected the binary opposition of philosophy and literary criticism in, in liberal philosophy, such as 
the pressure of the street, Habermas's fear of the masses, and Gulliver's solitude, the paradoxes of Swift's anti-individualism. In these essays, Warren demonstrates that while philosophy and literary criticism are distinct in terms of their object, a distinction between them in terms of method is not sustainable, and there is no, and there is no attempt in Warren's work to keep these separate, with the th literary theory of Marshray playing a crucial role in each of these philosophical interventions that he makes. Thus, we should consider Warren's work in literary criticism and literary theory, such as the unthinkable Swift and Louis Althusser, the um, little book that he published 10 years before the one we're currently discussing, as being of a piece with his work in philosophy, especially given that the studies of Althusser and Spinoza focus so crucially on the concept of reading. We look at these works, we see very different types of contemporaries of the discussion in terms of the relations between them. Louis Althusser is concerned with the works of Althusser and his closest collaborators, with the discussion of other contemporary figures being restricted to the introduction, which discusses the peculiar reception of Althusser's work within the Anglophone Marxism of the 1970s, including figures such as E.P. Thompson, Terry Eagleton, Frederick Jameson, Perry Anderson, Ted Benton, Barry Hindus, and Paul Hurst. In addition, this work, this book includes a reading of Althusser's autobiography, and in which the four Marxist figures who form the focus of Althusser's contemporaries, Lacan, Foucault, Deleuze, and Derrida, are listed as Althusser's philosophical allies. This claim is expanded upon in Althusser's Contemporaries, where Warren shows that Althusser engaged with non-Marxist critiques of teleology and humanism to intervene against those theoretical ideologies within the Marxist tradition. This can be contrasted with the unthinkable Swift, where Spinoza appears as an unthinkable spectral presence animating the literary conflict between Jonathan Swift and Daniel Defoe, who represented Aristotle and Locke in literature respectively at that time. This book led to a series of studies of Spinoza in which, which, in which Spinoza seems to be a tr truly singular figure within his conjuncture, besieged on all sides. In this context, I want to return to the question of literary reproduction, consider how, given that philosophy has no history, in the sense that experiences revolutions and counter-revolutions, but not structural ruptures and transformations like sci the sciences. These figures and debates are present in our conjuncture and how philosophical interventions constitute something like a work on the self, but only if we consider this self as both trans-individual and constituted as a we or an us in opposition to a they or a them. Um, of course, such alliance is always partial and strategic, and it's possible to depict each of these philosophical allies as structural adversaries, adversaries on specific questions. So let's consider how this question of, of, of an us before going on to consider why we necessarily form these alliances with the dead or nearly dead and here I want to return to the question of literary reproduction. Okay, so with regard to Althusser and us, the first thing I want to say is that this us-them boundary is not absolute, but rather porous and shifting, while Althusser seems far closer to Lacan, Foucault, Deleuze and Derrida, his non-philosophical allies, than to Marxists such as E.P. Thompson here. Um, if one considers concrete matter, political matters or the history of socialism and Marxism, um, to get back to what Juan was saying earlier in his talk, the lines of, of demarcation drawn would no doubt be quite different. For proof of this, one need only consult the writings of Warren's close collaborator, Mike Hill, who drew us extensively upon the writings of Thompson in several essays and in his, his uh, contributions to the book with, with um, Warren, the ad other Adam Smith. One might also think here of, of Foucault's theses on the Ricardo-Marx relation in the order of things, for example, which runs completely counter to that of Althusser and his students, uh, for example, Lacour. 
and to most in the Marxist tradition. Uh, considering the uh, uneven and contradictory manner in which these alliances are formed, we might think of them in terms of trans-individuality, in that any given theoretical juridical individual would in fact be constituted relationally along a, a variety of vectors, or to use today's metaphor, lines of force. In thinking about ourselves in philosophy, we are, we are thinking of us as constituted as a combination of trans-individual forms of subjection, as a conjunction of diverse philosophical positions that somehow manage to take hold in more or less coherent forms within various trans-individual philosophical collectivities. And yet these relations do not take place um, I think I cut this part out, but did not take place within some essential section along calendrical time, whether that be a year, a decade, or a generation, or a century, but rather extend temporarily into what we might consider our past, what came before, or our future, what is to come. Turning um, to literary reproduction, we must understand the author as a hermeneutic device and a text as surfaces with our depth in which we take up positions as philosophers. In fact, these imaginary authors that we talk about do have a paradoxical existence in their material effects, and that compels us to nonetheless engage with the, the canon that our opponents consider authoritative, as well as those of their opponents that we hope to, they hope to suppress. The text itself, as both the material arrangement of the characters on its pages and the whole edifice of interpretation that they, has been built up around it, and upon it, it exists only in so far as it's read and reread in its consumption, which is at the same time as reproduction. In engaging with texts, we intervene both within, within them and within this scaffolding interpretations that has been, as Warren often says, following Nietzsche, lyingly added to them as if it was their hidden essence. In intervening within a text, in pushing its theses to extremes, we not only transform its textual surface, but also our own place within it. We bring its contradictions to life, and we aim to turn the canons of the philosoph philosophical canon upon those who make it their fortress. In becoming philosophers, um, these long dead philosophical uh, personages become, in a way, our contemporaries. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was great. Go back to. Uh, oh, I wish I had presented my actual final version, but there we go. Um, okay. Well, okay. So I guess we can um, go to uh, Warren, who I think has a response or something to say. Are you kidding? Of course, I have a response. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, well, okay, let me first start by thanking the organizers, Joseph, Dylan, and Lala, and also uh, Miss Anushian uh, for that wonderful, that what is it, a poster, really. Yeah, it was wonderful, very nice, and I, I appreciate that. Um, and thank you to everybody for participating in this because it's... Uh, it obviously was a quite a bit of work, and uh, you know I'm very gratified to. Uh, I don't know if I deserve this, but anyway, I, I appreciate it. So let me let me go uh, very quickly, because I, I, this could take a very long time. I'm not going to do that, but let let me just go through some of the. I mean, I'll go through the talks, uh, not necessarily in order, but kind of thematically, uh, but but I will start with uh, Yorgos and um, uh, he about um, really looking at Derrida and Altisser uh, and their very different ways of uh, regarding the extent to which we can break with the present in philosophy, that is uh, break with the use of certain words or certain concepts and uh, it's, it's something that I actually uh, wrote, wrote about quite recently. And what, what 
there's something very, very interesting there, which is the fact that, uh, well, uh, I'll start with Derrida. Derrida, uh, as uh, Yorgo said, argues that we can't just, you know, um, exclude concepts that are in use. We can't pretend that, you know, we're not going to use them anymore and that will take care of the problem. These are metaphys what he would call at that time metaphysical concepts or uh, concepts that he doesn't, he thinks lead to theological notions, that sort of thing. And Derrida uh, argues and said, we can't get rid of them. We can't pretend, you know, they're just wrong and throw them out. And not just because uh, people won't accept that, but also because what are we going to replace them with? And there's too great a danger that we think we've moved beyond something we have not, in fact, moved beyond. And so his uh, approach to this uh, problem, it's a, it's a real problem, uh, is this idea of, of putting words sous rateur, which means... Um, well, it, how you translate it in English is, is a problem because it was translated into English by Spivak and others as uh, either er erasure or efface it to efface something. Okay, And in fact, in, in French, and of course, uh, Derrida borrows this uh, figure from Heidegger, it means to leave the word standing and put a line through it or an X over it. Okay, so it's not erasing the word, which would make it invisible, make it disappear. It's marking the fact that we are consciously preserving the word in order to cross it out. And uh, only by doing that can we guard against the possibility of well, the, the problem of pretending or even convincing ourselves that we have moved beyond a word and a concept that in fact still governs the field that we're thinking about. And so what, okay, this is a reasonable, not only reasonable idea, but it's something that you could imagine in some way Althusser himself proposing that you can't, uh, and, and it's typical of Spinoza's practice, you can't just invent a new word and then all of a sudden everything's going to be great. The idea is that you have to mark the fact that you are uh crossing out that word that is proposing to replace it but that you don't have something to replace it with yet you don't have the a concept that you know isn't going to be uh isn't going to arrive because of your will or because you want it to or because it's necessary so uh you could imagine that uh, altisser i mean it's very close to altisser's own notions in various ways the problem though and Althusser says this in a some of his notes that are not published on, on Derrida. He says that this is a way, in fact, or not, not it's condemned to be a way, but it's possible and, and perhaps likely that this strategy, in fact, ends up sort of making this word more permanent than it would have been without the, the X's over it that it, it, it sort of allows you to keep using the term, uh, even though you think you've crossed it out, you've still left it visible, and that this may be a way, and he, as time went on, he, <laughs> despite what he says in print, he thought that Derrida was uh, not sort of able to break uh, with certain concepts that uh, he thought he had broken from, and that this was a kind of hesitation about moving forward, about making a kind of rupture or break where it needed to be made and could be made, even if you, uh, you know, uh, didn't exactly have a replacement. Althusser himself uh, did a version of that, uh, which we've talked about, and it caused, you know, no end, no end of trouble for him and for subsequent readers. And that is, he preferred the paradox instead of the X over the word. And the paradox, or, you know, the, it's what uh, Balibar borrowed from uh, Pascal, the, the um, or Foucault, he borrowed from Foucault, borrowing from Pascal, the idea of the point of heresy. 
And uh, so what I'm talking about is the last instance that never comes, okay? And so while Derrida had a kind of spatial representation of the fact that we in some way need a new concept, that this, the concept that we use is not uh, adequate, but we don't yet have it. So we're stuck with this kind of, this ambivalence of a, of a crossed out word. And then Althusser does the same thing, but in time instead of space. And he's saying, yes, there's a last instance, but it never comes. And so uh, what does that mean? It, it means that there's no last, but he talks about a last instance, uh, you know, an end in some way. And so they both used these paradoxes. <laughs> and interestingly enough, they both criticized each other for using these paradoxes. And they're in fact doing something very similar. And in both cases, they in fact caused a, a lot of uh, confusion. And I mean, it was a it was a clever idea in certain ways. Um, you know, it's like uh, I was talking to Joseph recently about Althusser's idea of bending the stick uh, to to make it stand up straight. You have to think at the extreme. He said, "Okay, and this is an example." And later in his uh, Marxism and its limits, he said that was a mistake because often he bend the stick. And you know, it, it, thinking that it would you know bounce back uh, once he did that to its an actually upright position, and instead it just got stuck at the bent point, and so people misunderstood or you know, caused all kinds of confusion. And I mean, it doesn't. I wouldn't say that that strategy is completely uh, you know uh, impossible or harmful, but. Uh, he's at least looking at the effects of that. And both of them were doing that. And so it, it, it I mean, this is not a tragedy or something, but it indicates that, um, you know, making these kinds of changes, you see the same thing in, in Spinoza. You know, why does he use the word God? Why does he keep uh, right, for example? In, you know, and, and then ends up uh, defining it as power. And, you know, I mean, this... It can create confusion, but there may not be an alternative. And, you know, uh, I think now after 300 years, people can begin to read it a certain way. So I think that that um, this encounter around uh, the question of structure and imminence, et cetera, Althusser, even by saying the using the phrase absent cause, which he doesn't use that often, but he does use it just in reading capital. I mean, even that uh, is is a kind of paradox, and uh, it's a paradox that you you know it doesn't really allow you to think very much further. I mean, it, it's it's a way of ruling out external causes, expressive causality, or what he calls a linear causality, etc. But it's it's not an answer. It's it's a stopgap, and th there are a lot of those in Althusser, But you know. Uh, you can't just invent these adequate ideas out of nothing. So I, I think it's it's a it's a problem for for all of them, including Spinoza. But um, it's unavoidable. I mean, these are like tactical matters that uh, you have to deal with in some way. But I, I think they do end up causing quite a bit of confusion. So it's it's an interesting problem anyway if we think about it that way. Now. Um, Okay, related to that, I would say, I'm going out of order, is Panayotis' um, uh, discussion of, of structure, structuralism, etc. Because again, I think um, it, it's, a, it's a complicated story uh, in a certain way, more than I, I really got into in, in the book. Because uh, Althusser himself, if you look at, there, there are a couple of you know, rather obscure pieces that he wrote in the late 50s. And I'm thinking one in particular, and it was in the context of educational reforms and, and his idea towards science and things like that. And he, there are ways in which he really sounds like, you know, he could have been uh, uh, in Levi-Strauss's uh, camp or something like that, because he's arguing against a kind of, you know, uh, 
liberal humanism, but that in fact is not very liberal. It just wants to get rid of, uh, you know, philosophy and things like that. And who needs that? And so I think he he started as a kind of a rationalist uh, in in some way who was defending science, but you know, in a way that wasn't that different from Levi Strauss or whatever. Uh, from you know the sort of I don't know critique uh, in certain ways, but even more defending philosophy's role in defending science, and many of the problems that uh, he would criticize or the positions he would criticize as very problematic, these are things that that he himself uh, you know sort of uh, held. These are ideas that he himself. Uh, uh, propagated not in his famous works, but a little bit before that, and so there's a there's a progression from a kind of rationalism to the beginnings, uh, probably through Canguilhem, etc., of an appreciation of the actual practice of science, not some abstract model or your reason or something like that, and it's that confrontation with the practice of science that led him to you know, begin to have a critique of the formalism uh, that uh, is typical of structuralism. And also to see that formalism, uh, you know, could have a phenomenological basis and not just a kind of mathematical basis. So I, I think that he, there's a kind of uh, evolution or movement anyway that, uh, that shows that he was close. I mean, when he first, even in the seminar, when he first approaches Levi Strauss, it's it's much more positive than by the end. So you can sort of see him, you know, be a, even even the the homologies like that. He felt that there was something uh, positive there that uh, they were doing, and then later he was very uh, opposed to them. And so uh, you can see that he, which I think is a, is a virtue on his part, he's struggling very carefully looking at the various concepts that are uh, advanced by people like Levi Strauss or, well, you know, and, uh, people in linguistics, uh, Jakobsen, et cetera, um, and uh, looking at these for, you know, sort of concepts that could be useful, looking for, are they falling back into idealist modes of thinking, et cetera. And it's it's quite extraordinary to look at his, uh, the, the, the seminars on, on structuralism, on Levi-Strauss, et cetera. And then, you know, I mean, his, his uh, discussion of Foucault, which is quite different, uh, but also very, very interesting. I don't know if it's exactly related to structuralism, but uh, in the, at that time it was. So I, I think that um, it's a complicated story, but it's even it's more complicated and and probably more interesting uh, than certainly than I talked about in my in in the book. I think there's a lot more to say about it, and looking you know, looking at the early er, really early stuff that people basically don't even know about is interesting. And I, I recommend um, uh, Giacomo Clemente, who I think uh, I think Joseph, you told me he was the book is being translated into English on uh, Althusser and education and the university that sort of thing. It's an incredibly interesting book, and it focuses a lot on the earlier Althusser as well. And you know he was still in the Communist Party at that time. He so uh, you know it's not it's not an unfamiliar Althusser, but it's not quite yet the Althusser that we know. But uh, there, it's a very interesting moment. Okay, so um, let me see. Now, uh, oh, Natalia and the imaginary. Okay, uh, the one of the things that I, I found, and I've talked about this a number of times, but that that continue, continues to frustrate me, and you know. I, but I can't complain that people don't listen to me when I'm writing or something like that, but um, is the, okay, we have the the problem that um, Stefano was was talking about, which is the omni-historical and the historical, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but the the second, uh, I, I number them differently than Althusser, but let's say the second thesis is the 
um, in the ideology is the imaginary representation of people of an individual's real conditions of existence. Okay. And this is misread almost universally as, you know, it, it's a, it's a misrecognition of reality. Okay. And what's, what's important here is that what's, what's, uh, you know, what ideology is, is the imaginary relation to reality, not an imaginary view of reality. And the imaginary relation to reality, if we look at the rest of the, uh, the essay, the, the end of uh, the ISA's essay, is um, that the individual is the cause of his or her actions. That's the imaginary relation, especially your relation to your body. And of course, this comes from Spinoza. And so, as he explains later, we think ideas are in our head. And then if we have the will, we try to realize those ideas. And so the mind is in command over the body. And uh, uh, that's, a you know, in some way, it's a mistake. It's an error. But it's not just an error. It's not just an illusion. In fact, it's not an illusion. because And it's not just interpolation as some sort of you know, call or something like that. It's it's the reality of, for example, law, because you can't say I'm I don't control my body. I'm not responsible for the murder I committed or something like that. You are responsible, and that's your responsibility is woven into innumerable practices from uh, psychology, psychiatry, medicine. Uh, uh, microbiology to uh, legal uh, statutes that you know are going to punish you, and there's no getting out of that. It's not. A, it's not a just a, an illusion in your head. I mean, it may not be true as a description of the relation of mind and body, ideas and uh, actions, but it's absolutely material. And uh, there's no getting out of that. And that's a very important aspect of what he's saying. And, and people don't, that's the way in which the imaginary, in a certain way, is congealed into the form of lo law, which is, not, again, law is not just a set of principles. It's a set of, you know, uh, criminal courts, uh, jail, prison, confinement, execution, whatever, okay? And so he's trying to point out that, that something as, quote unquote, obvious as, you know, that our ideas are what we act on. And, you know, we, if we change our ideas, we'll change our behavior, et cetera. That this is, uh, you know, uh, some sort of fantasy, but we're, we're nevertheless blamed for the actions that we supposedly freely take. And uh, we, there's no escaping that. And whatever your ideas are, it doesn't matter because you're going to be addressed as if you are, uh, you have made a free choice based on your own beliefs or ideas or desires, whatever. And so I think this is something that's com just consistently misread and turned into something like ideology is illusion. And it's a very stubborn, very stubborn uh, reading of Althusser that uh, hasn't, hasn't really changed that much. I mean, hopefully it will, but I, you can't really even understand what he's talking about unless you see that. So I think that the, um, you know, what, what uh, Natalia was talking about is extremely important and it, it is related to Spinoza. I mean, you know, if we think about proposition two of part three of the ethics, uh, you know, where people, just assume that they are responsible for their acts and everybody else is, and they're the origin, they're self-determining, et cetera. And, uh, you know, that's extremely important. And w one last thing that it's connected also to um, part of what uh, um, Stefano was saying, uh, and maybe also what David um, uh, Galashvili was, was saying, it's, 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 there's this idea of uh, what we now call the subject and and also the idea of consciousness. And these are ideas that uh, Althusser wrote some things about it, but Etienne, uh, who's not here, 
uh, has written extensively. I mean, he wrote a book on Locke, which is about consciousness, really. And it's about the origin of the idea of consciousness. And uh, Natalia mentions uh, my argument, which is like a, I don't know, a way, to, a way of trying to understand what interpolation is about and uh, that sort of thing, uh, that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of self-surveillance that consciousness, which is a perception of what passes in a man's own mind, according to Locke, is a, a, a way of establishing what is necessary to make you responsible for your actions, which are based on your thoughts. And as Locke says himself, consciousness and, and um, uh, personal identity, which is guaranteed by consciousness, these are forensic matters, as he puts it, forensic, having to do with not just law, but courts, judgments. And there's a, the example that he uses of a man who uh, commits some criminal act and he claims uh, to have been, you know, so drunk, he, he didn't know what he was doing. And surely, you know, you're not going to punish him as you would otherwise. And Locke says, well, we have to punish you. Because, and I think this is very interesting too, because we will never know what's in your mind because you're completely opaque to us, which, which is another effect of a kind of interpolation. And because we'll never know what's in your mind, we don't know if you're telling the truth that you are drunk or delirious or something. And, you know, we're going to have to assume that you're lying. That's what he says. And uh, if you think that's unfair... Well, don't worry, because at the end of days, you know when that is, right? When at the end of days, the, the last judgment, God will see the truth. He'll be able to look into your heart and he'll excuse you. Or I guess he doesn't talk about the alternative, uh, punish you, send you to hell. Um, and so that will be your recompense for the for the, life, the time you spend in prison or your death or whatever. So uh, I mean, it's it's interpolation ends up being a very complicated operation. It's not just you become a subject, but you become a subject necessarily aware of yourself and uh, possessed of a subjectivity that is absolutely unknowable by others. And, you know, this is part of this debate um, that went on in the, throughout, let's say, the until the middle of the 20th century about solipsism, you know, that you can't know what another person thinks, et cetera. Adam Smith uh, has a statement like that. So um, I think that the ideas of consciousness and, and uh, also subject in, in the modern sense, uh, these are, are very important terms, and they're, they, you know, are not uh, ancient terms. I mean, that's the thing that, to talk about um, what Stefano was saying. The, uh, nobody's going to assert that, uh, at least nobody who's following Althusser is going to say that, you know, the idea of consciousness has always been there, because it hasn't. I mean, consciousness originally meant, you know, if you think of uh, Dylan was saying the the uh, Latin prefix cum or con, okay, means with. So consciousness originally meant uh, a, a knowledge that you share with others. That's what it meant, not your secret knowledge where, you know, your knowledge of yourself, which it came to me. And it's, of course, it's related to conscience. And, you know, so you have to be constantly looking at yourself if you are a person of conscience and you, you have to look at yourself because nobody else can. And of course, well, nobody else human, okay? But you know that God is watching you, watching yourself and will judge you on that. That's why you can't lie or something like that. You can't lie to yourself anyway. So, you know, these are ideas that are, even the notion of conscience that we now have, and, and as well as sub subject in that way, these are modern ideas, not not ancient ideas, and they do come into being really with um, you know certain well, let's say so social forms, et cetera, historically. And I that's why I I mean uh, I understand what uh, Stefano is arguing, and he's not wrong. 
uh, you know, because Althusser does say that ideology is omni-historical, et cetera. And um, I think what he's trying to do there is something that Michel Pescher was very interested in, which is the connection between ideology and the unconscious. And he tried to, he was exploring the idea that, you know, just as the unconscious describes sort of an invariant condition of humanity, et cetera. Uh, so, um, you know, ideology is, is a kind of similar uh, dislocation or something like that in, in humanity. And, I, you know, I, I was interested in that uh, idea um, when, uh, I don't know, in the 80s, I, I, I talked to Pescher, et cetera. But um, I, 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 could, I, I didn't feel that I was capable of going any further uh, there are a number of reasons about uh, Lacanianism, et cetera. But I, I don't think it's, you know, a, a dead end or something. I think it's it's a, a reasonable question. I think it's right to bring that up. Okay, I'm, am I, I'm, I don't want to take up too much time, Should I, but I mean, I still, can I just take a little bit more? Yeah. Anybody? No, you, yeah, you can. I'm talking to the organizers. You're okay. the authorities here. Okay. Okay. Um, I can't authorize myself. Okay, now there's a, a series of, um, uh, it's gonna be ridiculous to put these together, but um, I would say to address Despina, Lala, um, uh, Robin, and somebody else, uh, let's see. Oh, and ATN. okay, now. Um, and I, this is a very crude amalgamation. You have to just forgive me for this, but uh, okay. So to start with ATN, uh, because he, he was talking about Altusser's attitudes towards these things, you know, it's even more complicated than what he said, uh, because I, you know, I don't know what he said to his young students, whatever about Algeria and all that. But when, you know, in a few years later, in 1968, the end of 68, he wrote a letter uh, to, what was it, Nouvelle Critique, I think, the, the communist uh, journal. And it was to a, a man by the name of uh, Michel Verret, who was, who was a communist, but very critical of 68, because he thought it was the revolt of the princes, as they called it, the revolt of spoiled children of rich uh, families that were at the university rather than working in a factory and look how bourgeois they are, et cetera. And I'll just say who knew this person fairly well, and was friendly with him, was, you know, uncharacteristically sort of crude in uh, mocking him. And uh, he thought what he was saying was absurd. And one of the things that struck me, it wasn't just saying, you know, May 68 was also about young workers, et cetera. What struck me was he said, uh, because Vere was making fun of students that were all excited a few years ago about Algeria. And that doesn't speak well for the Communist Party that he would say that. Um, and, you know, what did it mean? It was just some fashion or something. And then Altusser said in response, my students uh, were all involved in the, the movement against the Algerian war for the liberation of Algeria. That's where they became radicalized. They, it continued you know, in, into their interest in what was going on in Latin America, the revolutionary movements there. And uh, you know, they, this will, it's, it wasn't a passing phase. This has shaped their anti-imperialist politics with the implication that that the CP should have had at that time and didn't. And so, I mean, there, there it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, sort of statement on his part because he, his students, almost all the ones that I've talked to, uh, thought he said he never talked about this stuff, but I mean, they were deeply involved and uh, uh, obviously he under, understood what the effect was. On they didn't go to the right or something. So, uh, he had some appreciation of that. And I think also in, you know, I think what Robin was saying about his, um, you know, sort of unspoken uh, uh, interest in, but also being influenced by the women's movement in France and perhaps elsewhere as well. 
Uh, and I, I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, the same thing, maybe through the Algerian struggle, but, uh, you know, maybe in other ways as well. Uh, you know, he. I wouldn't say that it was race exactly uh, in that way, because it's not, it wasn't the U.S., but I think, you know, the, like what we now call the racial or ethnic uh, sort of uh, hatreds, that kind of thing. I mean, he was aware of them and he, uh, you know, maybe by referring to Algeria and other things, I think that in some way, uh, he, there were there were uh, there was some influence even perhaps by Fenon because it, yes he did read Fenon even though everybody thinks he didn't um, and I, and I think that's important okay but I think what uh, the importance of what Lala is showing is that when when uh, you're in the middle of a struggle if it's in a factory or even at school etc you uh, are going, the racial and gender differences, and not only those, because Vespina is right, it's not only race, class, gender, the, the, these differences that may not ha have seemed very important uh, in the outside world can become absolutely decisive when you're trying to create a unified front of the workers against uh, the employers. You see the 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 subtle forms of inequality within the working class and the kind of chauvinism or racism that divides it and also the resistance and once you actually experience that struggle just like in iran i mean you know people in the u.s don't, don't even know there are minorities in iran they think it's all you know some uh, identical society whatever and in fact, it turns out that the minority populations in Iran, which are millions of people, you know, like 10, more than 10 million people, uh, exert a, a very important uh, influence on Iranian politics. And in some way, it should be familiar to us, they act as a kind of vanguard in certain ways be because of their the special kind of oppression that they face. And anytime there's struggle, they emerge as among the most radical elements in certain ways and most willing to fight. They have a tradition of uh, combat against the regime. And uh, it's, it's something that if you're really serious, including about class politics or whatever, you have to acknowledge. And if you're involved as a, an activity, you're going to have to confront these realities. And, and it could be things as you know, uh, not simply race, class, and gender, but disability or, uh, you know, just national differences, linguistic language differences, et cetera. These sadly can be uh, the source of tremendous conflict and division within the working class that the employers typically exploit. So, uh, I mean, I could go on and on, but I, I think the the when we look at the actual material existence of these things, they're not prejudices or uh, you know bigotry in some uh, like ideas or something. I mean, they exist in a very material form, and often the people who are you know the uh, offenders in this don't even realize what they're doing, and yet it's a it's a very serious problem everywhere, and especially now that we have so much demographic movement so I, I think that's that that issue is very very important to to uh, consider from the point of view as Lala says of Altisera that ideology has a material existence just because you know some abstract racism isn't uh, you know a part of the the scheme of production in some abstract way it doesn't mean that uh, it's not it's central to the struggles that go on in society. So we, we have to be very conscious of that. Uh, okay, now let's see. I don't want to skip over anybody. All right. Um, okay, Joseph and Juan. Um, and, and to some, okay, also uh, David McInerney. Okay, now I'll take Juan first uh, because... I don't know, it's a sort of opening to other things, but um, so the question is, uh, okay, Althusser was in the Communist Party, which, you know, uh, for most of us isn't 
wasn't the best place to be, but you know, it wasn't for him. He saw that as the, the party of the industrial working class, which was true. Okay. Uh, and he also saw, especially this is kind of paradoxical in a way, but after 68, uh, the people were very critical of the communist party on the far left, but they gained many members and would continue to recruit people into the you know early 70s precisely because at the end of the day even though they resist the leadership resisted every step of the way they gave in to their younger workers uh sentiment which was uh, even the the older cadre that were, went and were acting as leaders in the factories they came back and they said, we can't tell them not to go on strike. And we can't do that. I mean, we would be completely discredited. And so the Communist Party acceded to the sentiments of the younger worker militants in the party. And this made them look, you know, uh, we, we only re very recently learned about the behind the scenes uh, struggles that were going on in the leadership, but it made them look better than they actually were, and it made people forget Algeria, which is a huge issue for the the students, uh, younger people. Uh, and you know, they for for Altisair, this is better for better or worse. This is where the majority of the workers are, and they showed some willingness to bend to the will of the workers. But yeah, they weren't. They weren't. It wasn't a very democratic. Uh, sort of uh, organization to put it mildly even in the factories and uh Altisair became and I, i'm not exactly sure why i mean the spirit of may 68 he became uh increasingly interested in both party democracy uh, that is uh, freedom of debate and discussion which didn't exist and also you know what would uh post-revolutionary society look like and as one uh, uh, has said you know he was just beginning to think about something like workers councils the the the, par the forms of self-organization of uh, working class and and oppressed people that had become very visible in may 68 so he was open to that and and continued to be open to it uh till the end of the 70s and um so i mean it's important that uh, he was he was moving in a good direction although you know things became very very hard on marxists including him uh by the end of the decade but but uh, he was open and he was moving in a direction that was closer to the far left in certain ways um and and i think in when it comes because juan also asks about philosophy and i think you know, why did he care about dairy? I mean, he had a weird personal relationship with dairy. It was like a rivalry, but a friendship. I don't know. But um, it wasn't it, not to do with that. But his approach to all the, you know, what you might call post-structuralists uh, was that they're all, you know, you have to read them as uh, contradictory. And you have to look at the contradictions and look at you know the function of the dominant part of what they're doing at a given moment and judge it by its effects, not by you know the sort of doctrine that it represents. And Derrida undeniably, you know, uh, pushed a kind of materialist thinking uh, at a time when you know there was still the residues of existentialism and a kind of bad phenomenology that was very individualistic because not all of it was. Um, and uh, it was that still had quite a bit of power, especially in a, in a sort of the, the no man's land between academia and popular thought, that sort of thing. And Derrida played, a, you know, for him, an important role, as did Foucault with his many, you know, his many mistakes from Althusser's point of view, especially in the mid 60s and he saw these you know some of the thinkers of that time as allies even when he was critical of levi strauss uh it, levi strauss could be used against the idea of the you know autonomous uh rationally rational actor individual that sort of thing and that was his position i mean we can't just like 
dis distance ourselves from them and think we're going to wage a battle by ourselves because we have allies, potential allies, at, to a certain degree in certain ways, and we have to use them. And you know, it's a it's a was a fairly new way of thinking about philosophy, but. Uh, uh, it wasn't a question of adopting every word that they said or anything, especially Derrida. And because Althusser, despite his remarks about Derrida as the greatest philosopher ever or something, um, he didn't think that at all. And his private, uh, you know, his notes were very, very uh, rigorous readings of Derrida with all of the contradictions. So I, I and, and th that's something that probably they're short, but they should be published uh, as well, I think. Um, and then, okay, so uh, David's thing is about contemporaneity, I think, and contem contemporary contemporaneity. It's, I, I think it's absolutely right that, um, you know, I used it in a very crude way uh, as just, you know, his chronological, like the chronological, uh, f uh, people in the same chronological period as, as uh, Spinoza who were... Um, uh, you know, somehow important for him, and mainly as uh, adversaries. Although I'm, I'm changing my mind about Descartes to some extent, but, um, and I, I think, uh, okay, that's valid, but, but the, the critique of the contemporaneous is very uh, right. I mean, it's ridiculous to say, you know, we can't talk about uh, Spinoza except in relation to the people either before him or during his time. It's absurd because there are people who uh, are thinking about a century, two centuries later, who might in fact have much more in common with Spinoza and not as following him, but even, you know, as catching up to him in some way. I mean, the temporality is far more complicated than, you know, the idea of some kind of essential sections. I'll just share that. Uh, and I, I could say more about that. And then uh, Joseph, um, I think the idea of, of thinking, I mean, we, we discussed this uh, before, but uh, thinking in the conjuncture, on the conjuncture, that it is a way of uh, depersonalizing the thinking, just like depersonalizing the prints, de depersonalizing the people who do philosophy. And it's it's really uh, at, at the at the most uh, your relation to the nature to to what's going on in the conjuncture. And the conjuncture is a uh, a set of relations of force of different types, different uh, layers of society. And this is a collective relation that it's a collective uh, 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 perspective. It's related to the idea that you can't see everything from everywhere uh, and that there's certain uh, viewpoints that are much more, uh, you know, make you enable you to to see more than others. And I, I think it is that I think Machiavelli for him and Lenin, uh, you know, and Lenin is no more than Machiavelli, some unique individual. He was also very much part of a, a collective, which is a part of other collectives, etc. And and I think so. It is about that. It's also what you can see, and uh, but what what allows an individual to be to 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 occupy that a perspective is one of the questions that he's very interested in. And uh, I think that's something that there's a lot more to be, we could say about that. Uh, and then, sorry, one, one, oh, it's very late, I'm sorry, but one more thing, one more person. Okay. You ready? Yes. Long, you can let me do that? Of course. You're the chair. <laughs> Come on, you can tell me. I'm not, but you can. Okay. Um, very quickly, because I, I don't want to be unfair. Okay, Aurelio, um, I think, yeah, I think that the, the the definitions of philosophy, that's one thing, but what the, the actual practice of philosophy, which may not be reducible to his formal definition, uh, it, it changes a lot, uh, as people have said. And I think that the... Um, uh, this is something that, that uh, Banu was talking about in a certain way as well. Uh, I think that 
philosophy, um, in fact, begins to disappear. As, and if you want to call that an anti-philosophy, you you might be able to do that. It, that. That is, it's not that the role is any less important. It might even be more important. But the role of philosophy is not to contribute a doctrine, even a doctrine of not having a doctrine. It's not even that. But it's what it, what it does, it basically says this to the end, it disappears into its own intervention. That's what he says over in different places, which means that in, in uh, being practiced, it ceases to exist. So it's something that exists uh, for, a, it comes into being for a moment. And if it, if it uh, functions in the right way, it disappears. And you, as he says, you dis, it disappears into its own intervention. And, and I think that that is, um, if you want to connect that to anti-philosophy, you certainly could. I mean, uh, I, I'm not crazy about the book. I, I'm not that appreciative of the book uh, about non-philosophy, but uh, for many different reasons, which don't have to do with this really. But I think the idea of anti-philosophy, as you're talking about it, Aurelio, I think um, you, you could make a case out of that. Uh, from, I would say, uh, spontaneous philosophy of the scientists to the end, and and I think uh, it's really that book, the spontaneous philosophy of the scientists and Leonard philosophy that really arrive at this, you know, which is very different from the theory of theoretical practices just a few years earlier. It's incredibly different. So I I think that idea is certainly worth developing uh, further and then uh, Banu, a related issue with Banu is um, okay I when I, I don't know what I said really but, I mean I have some idea but okay what I would say now is that the the difference between a substantive void you know the nothingness uh, what what between that and what I would call the concept of the void okay is that and and this is was my real concern and and I have to say, I I got it from Balibar, a letter by Balibar that I discovered in the archive many years ago. I wasn't even supposed to see the letters, but they let me do it anyway. Um, and it was to Althusser, and it said, uh, "You're positing an origin, an originary void, which is in, going also to be an end. That is." It, you're guaranteeing that everything comes to an end and that becomes like a, a, an eschatological wish or something that, you know, uh, uh, I mean, speaking of the last judgment or the end of days, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of imaginary solution to the persistence, uh, we could say, uh, uh, you know, to be more historical, of capitalism. Because remember, capitalism was supposed to have gone a while ago, and it didn't, and it still hasn't. And, it, you know, it, uh, who knows what's going to happen. So this indefinite persistence of a mode of production when we've all, you know, at a certain point, Marxists had all calculated when its end is coming and that sort of thing. Well, that's gone. And uh, things appear, you know, Althusser's writing af well after not only 68, but the disillusionment about 68 and about the world, uh, every revolution either went bad or it didn't happen, etc. cetera. And uh, he, he's, he's thinking about that. And he, for Balibar, he's offering an imaginary solution that, that you know, is not, uh, it doesn't, meet the needs of uh, Marxist theory in some way. And and what, what I was thinking when I said uh, it's a concept rather than a substantive thing is that the the idea of void or, or the void or emptiness, et cetera, um, it, it's the idea of the space, like creating the kind of conceptual space or, I don't know, thinking the space necessary to allow things to reorganize, to change. Uh, because if you think of an absolutely coherent totality, there can't be change. I mean, it becomes a self-reproducing uh, uh, structure. 
And uh, the problem is, how the hell does this ever stop? And this, it's, it's uh, diltai, et cetera, but it's also uh, related to Altisser's own work on the ISAs and the uh, reproduction. So I think uh, in some way he's trying to, to uh, have, produce a concept that will prevent us from being stuck politically and theoretically with a kind of self-reproducing uh, uh, system that has no outside, where every space is filled and occupied, and uh, that it's all working to reproduce the system. And the void is another way of speaking of the cracks or the, the fault lines or whatever in the system that remain sort of uh, inconceivable or unthinkable for people. So, uh, you know, I, I think it is something like that. And um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure it's that his position or that position is related to Deleuze exactly. But um, I think that uh, my sense is that it, it, it could be a concept rather than some, you know, real, uh, you know, existing void or something like that, which he does uh, play with in some, some ways. OK, I'll stop there. All right, so um, thank you for that. Uh, uh, we do we so we are at you know the end of the conference. Um, people are uh, exhausted. <laughs> you know, people are welcome to leave. Um, I think if someone you know has a question, uh, you know, one or two people, maybe Warren can stick around for that. Um, so I'd yeah. You know, does anyone have any any uh, questions or? comments, either panelists or the attendees. <laughs> we just got a nice uh, obscene, but very. Uh... I could ask one. Yeah, go for it. OK, um, Warren, I just um, was listening to your comments earlier on law. And I thought of uh, the also Deleuze, and I thought of the one of the things about your book, and you, you don't talk about Deleuze uh, sort of after, in the 1970s, and yeah. specifically with, with regard to Guattari. And uh, I thought a little bit about whether you had any thoughts on their book on Kafka. Oh, the book on Kafka. They, yeah, they Kafka. brought the book on the trial, and I, and, yeah. you know, I, I just wondered. If, you had any thoughts on that to share with us? I don't know. I mean, uh, the book the it is is important in certain ways, but uh, because it, it proposes, I mean, what I thought was interesting about it is that it it and it's strange. I wouldn't have associated this with those two necessarily, but it's um, uh, it, it recognizes linguistic diversity in a certain way and how how important that is for understanding Kafka, the idea of a minor literature and um, the fact that he had to choose among languages and that, in fact, they have some sense of uh, the, the the background to the to the German text is it maybe other there's Czech and Yiddish is another language. And uh, they you know, they questioned the sort of unquestioned idea, especially in France, of a, you know, you have this, it's not just a dominant language, it's the language, period. And I mean, and that was being discussed actually uh, uh, around the same time by uh, Balibar's uh, mother, René, René Balibar, who was uh, uh, di di taught uh, French and the history of the French language, that sort of thing. And uh, the, she was part of a, a group that they were studying the standardization of French uh, historically, this, uh, getting rid of the provincial languages, which were some, you know, very different from French, and how there was this kind of uniformity that was uh, created and, and a, st you know, stylistic uniformity, a very like a, a very uh, kind of um, uh, 
a controlled uh, approach to the language. So there were only certain forms that you would you would use of those that were possible, like you would choose certain ones. And this and there were certain authors that were held up as the you know primary stylist. Uh, Flaubert was one of others. And uh, you were supposed to emulate them. So it's a very narrow use of language that was considered, you know, a polished style. It's a class thing, really. To, so it's to sound like, you know, you're cultured, meaning upper class and educated. You must write this way and speak this way. And of course, they didn't say that in the textbooks, but, you know. And so this idea of what is correct French uh, from a linguistic point of view, uh, you know, it's very bizarre because there are many different forms that you could use and et cetera. And it's, it's a very, it, there's a, a desire to control the use of language in, in an extremely strict way that uh, I don't know if it's characteristic uh, to that extent of other places. You know, that also means excluding foreign terms and everything, keeping the purity of the language. And okay, so she, she was doing the, the, that group was doing that, but you know, I think Deleuze and Guattari. I don't know that they read that or whatever, but um, I think that they're doing. They were looking at Kafka in a way that wasn't that far away from that. I mean, they weren't looking at French; they were looking at his German and uh, what it would mean to write from a kind of minority position. And you know, it's it. it there's a lot of criticism of what they say, which I don't know if, I, I mean, the, the criticism may be right, but there's still there's a lot interesting there. But I think it was very, it was, I thought, you know, they, they called it a minor literature. And I think it's a very, I, it's one of the more interesting things to me that they produced in that period. I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I mean, it's not what we the way we would do it now to talk about minority literatures, but I still think it's given France at that time. I think it's not just for them. I mean, there are many interesting things about a period. And I find it because it's about a text, it's not about, you know, everything like anti-Oedipus, me plateau, whatever. Um, I think it's it's quite I I, I think I liked it. Uh, I like that book, and I'm not Obviously, I'm not that crazy about, you know, Deleuze and Guattari as opposed to Deleuze. I think, you know, you said 70s. I'm, we could say the 60s is when I stopped with Deleuze, you know, really. And uh, I, you know, I, I that book is the exception, I would say. So that's it. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Everybody wants to go. No, I'm just talking about myself. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll stay. Okay. Well, I do think if there are no other questions. We could end here. We've had a long, uh, but really fun, interesting day. It's been great to see everyone and hear everyone's talk. And thank you, Warren, for that response. Um, yeah, this was great. Uh, the, so we did record this. Um, I'll share it when it's finished downloading. But um, yeah, we can we'll we'll end here. All right.